Hello, everyone. I hope you enjoyed our little break that we gave you, and I hope you're working on uh, completing your budget and trimming that budget down um, to your different wants and your needs. If you are confused at what I'm talking about, go back and watch the other videos. Today, we are going to talk about paying yourself first because so many times we focus on paying everyone else and we leave ourselves to last, especially you others out there. I know that you especially so think of everyone other than yourself and then you're kind of left on the back burner. So today we're gonna be focusing on you, um, paying yourself first and just creating uh, emergency savings so that if anything happens, you have money for a rainy day. So this is why we have our piggy bank with the little umbrella there. So Angie, um, I would love for you to just kind of take it away and let them know, you know, the process that we've been taking them on, kind of show them that we're almost there and what an emergency savings is and, and go into all that. Fabulous. Thanks so much, Shay. So Thank you again, everybody, for joining us for our 90-day commitment. And as Shay alluded to, if you are just coming in on this one and you're wondering, oh, you mean this is a part way through? Yes, there are several videos before. Please make sure that you uh, take a peek at those as well, because it gives a foundation for what we are chatting about. We kind of allude to a little bit, bit um, touch on some of those earlier ones, but you're really going to want that firm foundation as we move into our meat and potatoes areas. So again, my name's Angie and I'm based out of Winnipeg, Manitoba, Canada. Uh, and I love to educate, elevate and empower others so that they can uh, be in better control of their lives, um, body, mind and spirit. So in Shay, is my amazing mentor and beautiful business partner as well in the financial industry. So thank you so much for helping putting all of these fabulous informational videos together with me. It's not a small undertaking for sure. So paying yourself first. And as we go into this, first of all, we want to put a little disclaimer out there because the purpose of this presentation is to explain financial concepts and educate people about decisions that they're gonna be making about their finances. It is not intended for any sale or suggestions of any financial products, but rather to illustrate probable outcomes of these scenarios. So during the presentation, we ask that you don't record or take pictures. Um, and that's just to preserve the integrity of the information that we're providing. Please feel free, though, to ask us any questions, comment, like, um, reach out to us in any way. Um, or if somebody referred this information to you, uh, please make sure to reach out to them. Or again, as I said, to touch base with us personally. All right. So you've heard of becoming physically fit, you know, healthy, et cetera. But did you know that you can become financially fit as well? Um, so first of all, how to do that is to start to know where you are. So you can't do anything if you're not aware of where you're at. Um, and I can attest to that. I was the ostrich in the room, um, putting my head in the sand. So first of all, you need to know where you're at to know where you're going. Next, number two is to look at tracking your spending. That's everything. So the more honest you are with yourself, the more accurate your plan will be going forward. So tracking all of your spending, um, doing it on a month to month basis. Some of you may want to even break that down on a weekly basis, depending on how that money is coming in and out. Emergency savings. And I can see some of you going, uh, what? Because that emergency is just that. It's like one of those things that you never plan for, but you don't know what how to save for it either. So you need to look at how to save for those emergency situations so that you're not being caught completely off guard and it's not throwing you into a huge um, deficit, which is where we go into number four. 
snowball debt. Um, you want to look at where your debt is coming from. You want to look at uh, not increasing any new debt. Um, looking at how you can best manage that. We want to look at going into a balanced budget. You know, you want to have that scale on a balanced, balanced form, not where it's like this, going like this, right? So that is where um, the more honest you can be and the more you can stick within uh, the plans that you're creating, the better off you're going to be. Um, create a spending plan, you know, track and monitor, um, adjust wherever necessary, but none of this is going to work if you don't put a plan in place, right? And then once you have it in place, to stick with it as much as you possibly can. Which, when we get to six, you're going to be able to look at that S word. It's not a four-letter word. You know what? Savings is is there for your things that come up that are unexpected, right? So you wanna be able to fund that account or that savings so that it covers you for three to six months. Seem, it can seem a little daunting, but it is possible. That's why we're here. Once you have mastered all of that, guess what? You're a double F, you're financially fit, so yay. So all of these things are going to help build your financial house. Um, but when you do that, this is where we're touching on something that um, we've built, built this um, foundation within the first few videos. The money mindset can be a little daunting. You know, and you gotta take a moment now. Does do you look like the lady on my left here? Whenever you think of money, does you does it send you into a downward spiral? If you hate saving, you're not alone. But I would hazard to guess it's because you haven't learned how to do it correctly. Canadians love to spend, and with a shocking forty-seven percent of us. Spending to the brink of financial ruin, it's no wonder that we're in the state of this lady to the left of us. We get into that state of stuckedness. We think that it's not possible. There's no way that we can do it. Um, but that's because, again, we haven't learned how to do it correctly. We haven't been educated. Uh, we haven't, we're just in a state of not having the right information at our fingertips, which is where I love to say that we love to empower, educate, and elevate. So this is going to elevate your state of being so that it's not going to seem so scary. Saving money can provide freedom to travel, freedom to lessen your stress level, because guess what? If you don't have your health, you don't have anything. So we want to take away that stress so that you are going to feel more at ease and you're going to be able to move forward in your career, in your business, in your life, in your relationships, in all areas and actually experience joy. So saving money and getting ahead. So according to the 2019 Canadian Financial Capability Survey Attention, whew, that's a big mouthful, 36% of Canadians don't have an emergency fund that would allow them to cover three months worth of expenses. However, among those aged 55 and under, that figure actually is increased to 46%. It's a little bit, that, that number is a little scary, but unfortunate surprises like a loss of employment, an illness, major repairs to a vehicle or a home, those can happen at any time and they can take a financial toll. So it's important to have that emergency fund. 
Um, if you are like many Canadians um, out there, many Manitobans, just many people in general, where you're barely making it from month to month, having an unexpected expense can seem like you will never come out of that. Saving money should not be as difficult as many people think. It may require some tweaks to how you currently do things, but those changes don't have to be super radical. You don't have to change your entire life in order to do this. It just takes little steps at a time. And one of those first things to look at, it's the B word, it's the budget. And that doesn't have to be a scary word. As you can imagine, you need to start paying attention to how you spend your money. You may need to embrace, and here's an F word for you. Don't worry, we're PG here. It's the frugal word. May need to look at some alternate ways to live in your lifestyle. And this, all this really means is being smarter with your money, making it go further. So we want to move you into a savings mindset. And that's why money mindset is so important. It just takes a few tweaks in your mind. And you're going to wonder at the end, why did I not do this so much earlier, I could have saved myself so much stress and anxiety, and I would have been able to breathe. So when it comes down to saving money and getting out of debt and achieving financial freedom, there's the little things that you do day to day that actually matter a lot. So here's some mental tricks that can help you out. Ask yourself this one question before buying something expensive. Will this purchase improve my life in the long term? Is it helping you meet your financial goals? So you can produce a list of things you want to spend to make you feel fulfilled, such as travel, relationships, health, career advancement, and hobbies. The $100 rule. If you're spending more than $100 on something, do a proper online research on that product. This will stop impulse buying and make sure it is worth that purchase. You know, <laughs> I'm one of those people that I can have a little bit of an impulse buy. Um, and one of the simple things that I did was a, I stopped just mindlessly going to stores when I'm bored. Figure out why you're spending. Think about your spending and why you're doing it. So calculate your real per hour earnings. For example, if you make $30 an hour, but after tax, it's more likely closer to $22 an hour, you might want to think twice about impulse buying that $100 item. Uh, if you realize it'll take four hours to make that money back. Knowing that time saved today will multiply with time. So um, $100 saved, then invested today at 7% rate of return per year will be worth almost double that amount in 10 years. It will make you more likely to save if you think about it this way. Now, I touched on emergency fund. So what the heck is that? And what qualifies as an emergency? Emergency fund requires planning and a budget. Once you've paid off any bad debt, or at least on your way to doing so, you can focus on setting money aside uh, and developing good saving 
habits. If you have cash set aside, you won't have to borrow money or go into debt if your income drops unexpectedly or if something unexpected happens. So an emergency fund should be easily accessible and set aside for, you guessed it, for emergencies, right? So it should also be in an account that is ideally without a fee attached to it. Um, so it should be in a high interest savings account. So why do we want to create an emergency fund? Well, if these last few years have taught us anything at all, it's that having an emergency stash can be of the utmost importance. Who would have guessed that COVID would hit? Who would have guessed all of those other things that um, all those residual fallouts would have happened? One day you're working away thinking, you know, about your vacation plan six months down the road. And the next day, all of the world has been turned upside down. So some of those reasons you may want to start creating that emergency fund could be as simple as it, that you're trying to pay off your debt. Or you just started paying, paying off your debt um, and you want to be budgeting towards that. You only have one income or you're self-employed. Something that if you are self-employed and you are looking at this, um, whether you've started it or not, you need to look at your tax bracket and what you're going to need to be putting away, not only for unexpected uh, situations, but also for tax time. Um, that's something that a lot of entrepreneurs don't look at is setting money away each month so that you can handle the effects of that income when it comes down to reporting your taxes. If you are a homeowner, home repairs can be expensive. And if you've ever had a renovation project with, with what you start out with, nine times out of 10, it's going to have a few other things attached to that, especially if you live in an older home. If you live far away from your family, you may need to look at starting some funds so that you can travel back and forth in case an emergency happens. Your own medical emergency in case, yes, in Canada, we have um, a lot of our medical systems paid for, but there are special circumstances where they aren't covered. Or if you wanna see a specialist, there may be additional charges for that. What if you lose your job? But it could be just that you're saving up for that trip. You're saving up for a goal. You're saving up for say your kids tuition if they're going to school. The fact is, is that if you don't prepare for an emergency fund, it could mean leveraging high interest debt or scavenging for money wherever possible or simply not being able to afford it at all. Although an insurance policy can cover any car accident expenses, you may need to access cash immediately while the policy is settled. Um, additionally, you likely need to pay a deductible to access your insurance. And that can cost anywhere from $200 to $1,000, depending on what um, your deductible is, depending on what insurance you have. So when do you use an emergency fund? And this is where I had said, what qualifies as an emergency? A sale at Nordstrom's or at uh, Reitman's or at Ikea or wherever does not count as an emergency. You may think it does, but that's, that's not what we're talking about here. So it could be tempting. It is so tempting to tap into um, any extra funds that you have when you see an excellent 
say your cruise deal or, you know, a, a special trip. Um, there's with the West jet sale or whatever. Um, keep your emergency savings account intact. Have it that it's accessible, but that you need to think twice about it. You don't want to be accessing and tapping into that emergency account. And then when you really do need it, say there's a flood, flash flood, that, that emergency fund could have funded. However, you've used it to go on that WestJet trip and you come back from your trip and now you need to look at not only um, building it up again, but you now need to tap into other alternative resources to pay for that emergency that it was supposed to be there for. So there's some appropriate situations to use an emergency fund for, and that would be for loss of employment or a reduction in income, a significant home or appliance repair, such as flooding, like I said, um, a fridge or washing machine breaking down. Uh, say you have an emergency car repair. And I don't know about wherever you guys are living, but here in Winnipeg, uh, when it gets to, you know, the melting level, we're not there yet, but uh, in a couple of months, the potholes are horrendous here. So that wreaks havoc on your vehicle. And that could prove to be a pricey repair. You may also have some sudden medical or dental expenses. Now, things happen and there might be a sudden illness of a family member, your pet, or even yourself. That could result in thousands of dollars in expenses. We don't like to think about that, but the reality is there. This is also why an emergency fund is crucial, especially if you don't have insurance to fall back on. So how much do we need? You're probably thinking, hmm, okay, here's where it comes in. Um, this, is, this is the scary part. However, you know what? No. <laughs> This, it's not great to think about. You may think that we're all just doom and glooming here, but the reality is, is that we just want you to be prepared. The more prepared you are, the less this is going to become a stressful issue when it happens. Shay, do you wanna pop in here as well when, while we're talking about how much do we need? Absolutely. So this differs for a lot of people. Um, so I want to keep it, just rule oriented so you can establish it for your own situation. So I know it seems overwhelming to think about your future self instead of going on that shopping spree right now, or, you know, the uh, retail therapy, as they say, but you, you will, like Angie was saying, really thank yourself in those situations if you do have this set up. So a great rule of thumb to go by uh, when you're creating your budget and when you're trying to figure out what you want to set aside for emergency fund is use the 50, 30, 20 rule. So you can spend 50% of your income on your needs, 30% on your wants, and 20% can go towards saving or your emergency fund. This helps you feel like you're not constricting yourself too much. You can still enjoy those fun things in life while also knowing that you're doing the right things for your future as well. So how you would manage that is if you had a big purchase, like a cruise or something where that 30% of your income isn't enough, you would just allot for it a couple months um, at a time until that 30% that you're setting aside adds up to your cruise, for instance, or those nice pair of shoes at Nordstrom or the bag or whatever you'd like to pick. So if you save enough to cover you for about three to six months, that's kind of how much an emergency will um, take you to kind of a sort out, figure out, um, and then get back to your regular routine. So I know it can seem overwhelming to, to have three to six months worth of salary. Um, it can be a lot at times, depending on how much you earn. But 
Um, it's just a goal, right? At the end of the day, you can start off with one month, you can start off with one week's worth, anything's better than nothing. So just getting the ball rolling and it'll all add up as you keep going. So it's normal for this to take a couple months, sometimes even years to accumulate this three to six months worth. And of course, we hope that as you accumulate it, you don't need to pull out of it, but life happens. So don't panic, don't stress about it, just work towards it. And again, if you create that mental mindset that you're going to have that emergency savings, then eventually it will come. So if it is feeling overwhelming, you can then just start with a small amount and increase as you go so you don't get discouraged. So it could be $50, it could be $20, it could be $5, but every $5 makes a difference. So just to give you some examples. So if you set aside $5 a week, by the end of the year, you'll have $260 set aside. Keep in mind that you could also be investing this and it could be growing even quicker. $10 a week, you could have $520 by the end of the year. $15 a week, you could have $780 um, at the end of the year. And then $20 a week, you'd have just over $1,000 by the end of the year. So that could be some of your guys' one month income. That could be some of your guys' maybe two week income. But as you go, you can just slowly increase it. Sometimes I even tell people, hey, start with $5 and in three months time, I'll check in with you, see if you're comfortable with that. We can increase it to $10. Three months down the road, I'll see if you're comfortable with that. We'll increase to 15. And if we slowly increase it, you're not going to really notice it missing. What happens so often is we try to drastically change our lives like that. And it's hard to stick to that new routine because we switched everything. It's better to switch one thing and just gradually increase and add things on. And, and then it's not going to be so overwhelming. Now, the best way to do an emergency fund is to automate it. So set it up so that $5 every paycheck is taken out. Uh, you can set it up on your online banking or you can talk to your bank teller and ask them to have $5 every two weeks taken off your um, account and into a savings. Um, this Or a TVSA if you'd like. But this way it's already done out of sight, out of mind. You don't even think of it getting done. Um, and that way if life gets hectic, it doesn't get uh, hindered by the hecticness of life. So like we were saying, now, where do you place it? So now I have this money. Do I just stick it under my mattress and get a lovely mattress or, or what do I do, right? So there's a couple different ways, but you want it to be accessible. You want it to be accessible, but not too accessible because you don't want to just dip into it all the time, but you do want it to be within a couple days notice, you can have it accessible. So you want to keep it separate from your current bank account so that you don't see it grow and feel like it's money to be spent. Um, there's many different savings vehicles, so you can do your research as to where you decide you want to keep it. But um, some great places to start would just be a high interest savings account, a regular savings account, or a tax-free savings account. Um, those would be your more accessible accounts that you can open. But again, you can always wait and contact with us. We can help you create an uh, emergency savings fund. We can help you manage it as well. Um, that way we're just a text away to your account, but you can always talk to your local bank as well. So how to save? Sometimes finding spare change just isn't as easy as it seems. Sometimes you're digging in the couch, trying to find a quarter or trying to find a dollar. Um, and sometimes it's just not as easy to find that, that spare change. So if um, you feel like extra money is not the issue, it just was knowing where to put it, then you have your rule, 50, 30, 20 rule, follow that, try to put aside as much as you can and you're good. If you're somebody where you're like, look, I looked at my budget, I tried to trim as much as I could, but this is, this is the state of my situation. I don't have anything left over to put in an emergency fund. I got nothing. This is where you keep listening because we're gonna just go through a couple different lifestyle shifts that you might want to think of doing um, to expand your income and make it go a little further. So this is going to be some review, some new stuff as far as the trimming the budget, okay? So you want to eliminate any expenses and save that amount for your emergency fund. So your current budget won't be affected or um, you'll be able to grow your funds quicker. You want to determine your expenses that you can eliminate. And I know we talked about this last, day, um, last week about your 
or two weeks ago, pardon me, about your needs and your wants and distinguishing which ones those are. So we're going to look at more of the wants than the needs and try to, to decompose those a little bit. So again, needs are necessities, obligations, essential to living and surviving, wants or desires, wishes, non-essential items. So here are some ideas of ways you can save. So before we were saying that saving doesn't have to be drastic, living frugal doesn't have to be drastic. Now I'm going to go into the drastic stuff first, and then we're going to work our way down to the less drastic. Okay. So saving on the big three living expenses. So you have three categories that eat up a lot of your budget and that's your living expenses, your taxes, and your debt. So last week we talked about ways to get her last, I keep saying last week, but we gave you a week off. The last uh, presentation we talked about debt recovery and ways to get down and chip away at that debt. I'm gonna give you some tax uh, opportunities today of things that you can claim to potentially get a bigger tax return at the end of the year. And then we're gonna look at living expenses and ways that you might be able to reduce your living expenses just by um, just being a little bit more aware of um, opportunities out there. But within that, there are three major contributors to your living expenses alone that are going to be taking away a lot of that portion. And that's your housing, your transportation, and your food. So we're gonna break down ways to save in these areas. And then of course, I'm gonna give you a few more. So you might be joining us. Now this is based in Canada. I know some of us are joining from the States and across the world, but you might wanna look at where you're living. And if you're feeling like you're living paycheck to paycheck, it might be an option to look at either moving further away from the city core and having a cheaper rent or um, maybe moving cities entirely and seeing you can transfer. Um, but living expenses, that's going to be the majority that, that this could be pretty much your whole paycheck going towards rent, right? So if that's reallocated then that, that, that saves you from having to save all the nickels and dimes everywhere else. If you just change this one thing, you can do everything else the same, right? So this is one thing that it's a big thing to change, but once you change it, it's, it's a big change as well. So look at the difference between living in a place like Vancouver or Toronto compared to living in a place like Winnipeg um, as far as rent, right? Um, or even living in Alberta. $882 compared to $1,490 to live in Surrey, BC, right? That's, that's quite a bit of savings that you could have um, to put towards your debt, to um, put an emergency savings. So just keep that in mind. It could just be living 20 minutes further outside the city, but having a cheaper rent or even just looking at different apartments and see if you can find a cheaper rent in your area. But a lot of the times we just kind of find our, our comfort zone and we stay there. We don't look and see if there's any other opportunities. So for renters, um, a lot of things that people aren't aware that you can do or maybe um, just never really thought about, you can actually negotiate when you re-sign your lease. So if you have a good relationship with your landlord, you can actually ask and see if, if you're a good tenant, if they'll give you a discount on your lease um, when it's up for renewal. You can take that time and shop around, make a list of at least four or five different units that you wanna look at, spend time um, to look inside of them, see what's going on, see if you can negotiate prices with those renters when they know that you're looking at a couple different units. If you look at the winter time compared to the summertime, there's less buyers, so they might be a little bit more lenient as far as um, negotiating. Look at getting a roommate. If you have a basement, you could lease out the basement. They could also cover your mortgage in that sense. And then that's money in your pocket and you could split all the expenses. Living further away from the city core. So if you're renting downtown, it's usually much more expensive than the suburbs. So maybe you can consider um, working in the city core. Maybe there's a remote option for you. So you can only work part-time at work um, or so have you. So you can maybe talk to your, your boss about that. Check for hidden costs. Um, a lot of the times we see that the utility bills are covered and sometimes there's ways that you can 
move those fees or reduce those, those little fees. Um, sometimes there's fees for booking an elevator and apartments and stuff like that. So you can um, sometimes negotiate those. Like I said, looking for a place in the winter time, less people are looking around. So people are more desperate to find renters. Sublet your place. So if you're going away for a couple of weeks on a holiday um, or you have a cabin, perhaps that you don't use all the time, that could be an Airbnb option where you could generate some income. Or you could just have, um, you could have someone stay there for a week or two and just put it up as an ad. If you're a homeowner, when your mortgage is up for renewal, you can negotiate for a better mortgage. So look beyond the big bank mortgages. So you could look at smaller banks, which are a little bit more competitive with their offers. Um, they usually have access to hundreds of lenders if you go with a broker. Um, I have a referral um, broker that we use. So if you want um, help with negotiating your mortgage, if it's up for renewal, just um, Angie, if you want to put our emails in the chat or in the uh, box below, then they can message us. So you could get a better deal, maybe a lower interest rate, and that could add up greatly over the five-year term of your mortgage. Put down 20% to save on insurance. If you put down 20% as a down payment, if you haven't got your house already, um, you'll save on the Canadian Mortgage and Housing Corporation insurance. So you'll get a discount on your insurance when you claim. Learn to use Airbnb. Turn your home into an income generator when you're gone on vacation. Even if it's for a short trip, you can just say the duration that it's your house is available and then you could have it rented for the time you're gone. Home renovations. Be wary of home renovations. Not all home renovations increase the, the uh, asset of your house. So check in to see if it's actually going to benefit you long term to do that home renovation or if you're just doing that for yourself. Um, they can also become up way more expensive than we anticipated once you start going. So always make sure that you allot for way more than what you think you're going to spend. And then that way you're not going into debt because of it. Start a business. Whenever you have a business, you can write off portions of your property tax, your insurance, your utilities, your Wi-Fi, your cell phone, your cable, uh, your home office, and it'll also, of course, generate income on the side. Save on your utilities. Make sure that you're going green and you're buying energy efficient appliances. So um, that could come down to maybe you reworking your insulation, cleaning your filters, changing your light bulbs, getting more effective ones. Now don't go crazy with this because of course you don't want you to go into debt to save on utility bills, but um, it's definitely just something to think about if you are gonna be doing those renovations anyways and you are gonna be switching um, different lighting or anything like that, think of going energy efficient. Decline mortgage life insurance. What I don't think a lot of people realize is that with mortgage life insurance, the money is actually decreasing with time. So the benefit that you're paying for is decreasing with time. And then if anything happens, all that money and that benefit goes to the bank and not your family. With personal life insurance, it travels with you. The benefit doesn't decrease and that benefit goes to your family. And then they can choose how they want to distribute it or who they want to um, pay off and settle. So it's number one, usually, um, more cost effective. And number two, it's just more beneficial for you and your loved ones. Saving on transportation. So after the housing, the next is transportation. And with gas going up to, I think it's $2 a liter where we're at, we're at um, it, it's, it's going to be a costly one soon. So saving on transportation. Um, as my Regina George likes to say, um, ditch your gas guzzler. It's never going to happen, right? Um, we have these vehicles we love. We get emotionally attached to our cars. We have different experiences in them. So I'm not necessarily saying that you have to get rid of your car and, and drive a Prius, but um, there are other options, okay? <laughs> So you can negotiate on your insurance. Um, now it, here in Manitoba, we don't really have that option, but um, depending on where you're at, if you have private insurance companies, you can see if you can shop around for a better rate. You can go and look around and see if you can buy a used um, car. You can save on used cars by about 20 to 25% of their original value. So if you're buying a new car right now, you could sell and go to a used or um, shop around and see if you can trade your vehicle in and actually end up pocketing some money at the end. It's a seller's market right now for vehicles. 
avoid buying premium fuel. So a lot of the times we think, oh, if I buy the premium fuel, it'll last longer, but sometimes it's not cost effective to do so. It's, it's pretty pricey to do the high octane or any of those. So just go for the regular fuel. Beware of upselling. So um, whenever you go and talk to a financial manager, if you're buying a car, they're always gonna sell you warranties. Make sure that you're reading the fine print, you're understanding what you're gonna benefit from. Is it worth it? Um, make sure it's in your best interest. Get active. If it's not, I mean, I'm not gonna tell you to go outside and walk to work right now uh, with it being so cold, but maybe in the summertime, maybe you could bike or walk or skateboard or run or um, um, find a different way to get to work. Number one, you're, you're getting in better shape. You're killing the, the gym and, and getting to work all with one stone. Uh, you can ease up on your lead foot. I know with me, whenever I go red, I'm like revving my, I'm ready to go when it goes green. I feel like I'm in a car race. I'm in a NASCAR. I'm revving my, my gas pedal, but that eats up on gas. So just take your time, give yourself time to get to work. And then that way you're not going pedal to the metal swerving lanes and um, taking up all your gas. Buy smaller. So if you have a big vehicle, you might want to look at maybe downsizing, maybe going to a hybrid. Look at public transportation. Um, even if it's, it doesn't have to be every day, but a couple times a week can save you on gas. Um, and it's usually cheaper to, to do a carpool or public transit than it is to fill up your vehicle sometimes. Sometimes it's best to just not buy a vehicle at all. Maybe it means selling your vehicle for now, pay, focusing on putting that gas money and that, that um, car fee towards your debts, taking public transportation. And then once that's settled, you can get a vehicle again. That, if that's not a motivator to pay off your debts, I don't know what is having to take public transportation until you pay them off, right? Um, so if you want a motivator, that's that's a way. And it could be, you could pick out the car you wanted and all those bills that you were paying towards your debts or the money that was going to work your debts can now be the amount that you can use towards your car payment. So you can reallocate that. Do electric vehicles. So look at maybe doing a hybrid or an electric vehicle um, so then you're not having to afford your, um, a lot for gas. So maybe an electric scooter, a longboard. Um, you could even be one of those people that ride a unicycle if you'd like. <laughs> so saving on food. I'm definitely this, this little cute guy here. When I see food, I typically eat it. That's the diet I'm on. Um, especially if I go to the grocery store hungry. So Here's some tips on how you might be able to save on some food. So I don't know if you've realized as well, but where we're at, I've noticed that when I go to the grocery store, that $100 doesn't buy as much as it used to. Um, so we need to even be more conscious of our spending habits. In 2018, the average US household is expected to spend over $7,000 on food in a year. And if you think, well, Canadians, we're Canadians, so that doesn't apply, we're worse. We're, we're higher, okay? So um, it definitely applies to a lot of us. So a, a number one thing in, in a lot of financial books, um, Automatic Millionaire, that one of the books I gave you guys to read, um, the last presentation talks about this as well. Just the amount that you can save if you just put aside that $5 that you were gonna spend on coffee, in an emergency savings, it adds up, okay? So um, try and just even cut that out, make coffee at home, meal prep. Um, if you meal prep for a few days at a time or even longer, if you decide to freeze it, so if you make in bulk and then stick it in the freezer, this can be super convenient, number one, so it saves you time and it'll probably save you money and you'll probably be healthier along the way. Maybe buying in bulk, shopping at Costco. Now, keep in mind, if you only live by yourself, maybe Costco isn't the best because you end up throwing things out. Um, so make sure that it's reusable things or um, that you're going to use it in the time before it expires. But Costco's hands down the cheapest way to get ingredients for foods, especially if you, um, and if you hate cooking, then there is fantastic pre-made meals that you can buy at Costco for cheaper than just, skipping the dish or um, going through a drive-through. Replacing the social aspect of eating at a restaurant, have people over, barbecue, do a potluck. Potlucks are great because it's not all on you to provide all the food. So it saves you a little bit of money there. 
instead of going out to eat and having to afford a tip and the drinks and all the other stuff that apply. Have fun cooking, look up new recipes, take a, a cooking class with a friend, cook with a partner or host a cook-off with friends. Invest in good Tupperware. So if you prepare food properly, you can take, you're gonna have takeaway lunches, fast breakfasts and proper containers for storage. Go to expensive restaurants sparingly. So wait for a special occasion, a reason why you're doing the big expensive restaurant. Otherwise, just eat from home. So these are practical ways to save when you're grocery shopping. Of course, we still have to go grocery shopping, right? But I know that I've, I'm not the only one that, who's been in the situation where we say, oh, I'm just going to run in and grab one thing. And then you just, oh, let me just go up and down the aisles. And the next thing you know, you're dragging four carts behind you and getting the, the sales assistant to help you ring everything through, right? So number one is never go shopping on an empty stomach. And I know that I'm not the first person to tell you that. Um, but the next is to prepare a grocery list in advance and stick to the grocery list, just like you're going to stick to a budget. Don't sway. You know what you need. You wrote it down. Stick to that. Buy in bulk. So when you buy in bulk, there's usually even a dollar or two savings that you'll save. But again, over time, that adds up. Buy generic. The name brands and the no name brands are not that different um, for the most part. So if you buy the generic version and actually look at the price tag, it's, you're not going to notice a big difference. Use a calculator. So a lot of times we just pile things up in our cart and we have a budget in our mind, but it ends up being way more because we didn't add up how much everything costs. Check your receipts. At the end of the day, cashiers are human. They might've scanned something twice um, and, you, and they didn't notice that they charged you. But if you are just doing that, your due diligence, then you can make sure that they didn't double charge you. Eat before you go shopping. So at least you're, you're gonna be sticking to your budget. Comparison shop. So before you go, um, if there's a couple different grocery stores in your area, see if which places are cheaper for the things that you're looking for. Don't be embarrassed to cut coupons either. Um, I know that we maybe feel a little um, intimidated or embarrassed when you're standing in line and handing coupons. And But at the end of the day, it's your journey. It's no one else's. So if that $2 or that $5 is going to save you and that's your $5 that you can now invest because you did that, have no shame in, in cutting coupons. Buy quality items and make sure you're not buying over the amount that you're gonna use so you're not um, wasting. Leave the kids at home because the kids always wanna buy extra things that aren't on the list. And then avoid prepackaged goods because as soon as they've been altered, then they charge you for the labor that was um, required. So if you buy the cut up pineapple instead of the whole pineapple, if you, if you Get the flavored chicken over just the regular chicken. Do the, do the work from home and, and save yourself the money. Another place you can save after the big three is saving on your credit card, your banking and your investments and insurance. So these are things that you don't have to change your daily lifestyle for. These are, these are things that wouldn't require you to be frugal, okay? So using a high interest savings account. If you store money, um, if you don't wanna use a TFSA, you can use a high interest savings account. And then that way your money is growing in interest. Saving your loose change. There's apps like Milo that you can use um, and other apps similar that will round up your purchases and store your change. Or whenever you get home, if you have cash that you spent, put the change in a jar. And you can include um, money that you spent on goods, tax refunds, commissions, bonuses, inheritances, and this can help you build up your emergency fund. So you can wait for it to build up and then take it to the bank, or you can use it to pay down your debts, or you can use it to invest. Use reward credit cards. I know a lot of us have credit cards that offer rewards. We never actually look to see what the rewards are. So we're not benefiting. Different cards are for grocery cashbacks. Different cards are for different stores. Um, some have travel incentives. So knowing what those rewards are and using those cards smartly um, and according to what the rewards are will make you hit those targets quicker and will also help you remember kind of what cards are for what things. So if you're a travel lover like me, then you'll want to choose a travel card that builds up travel points or access to lounges. And then you can use your credit card, obviously pay off your credit card back, but then that will help for your 
trip that you're saving for or that you have a goal for. So then that way it's, it's helping you contribute to that. Bank fees. So look at banks such as Tangerine um, or talking to your bank. And if you open an investment with them or a savings with them or multiple accounts with them, sometimes they, they take away the fees that you pay. And that fee that you were paying could now be allocated towards investing or saving. Now this is a little small, so I apologize for the small writing, but tax season is upon us, right? So here are some things that you can claim um, on your taxes to possibly get tax deductions. And then um, you can possibly get a rebate at the end of the year. So childcare expenses. So as a parent, you can deduct up to 8,000 a year for a child age seven or younger. And for children between seven and 16, you can deduct $5,000 a year. So claims expenses like childcare, nannies, daycare, nurseries, um, boarding school, and more. So have a look at that. Talk to your accountant. Spousal RSPs. So if your spouse makes more than you or they're in a different tax bracket, they can contribute to a spousal RSP and your contributions won't affect the available contributions in your room of your spouse or common law, but it'll help when it comes to tax season. Paying into your RSPs for yourself. Uh, will give you an income break and will end up in a tax deductible by the end of the year. This could be either RSPs for Canadians, 401ks for Americans, and you can set aside up to 18% of your income per year, and that is accumulative. So if you haven't been contributing, you can contribute more if you're making a little bit more. Medical expenses. So any uncovered medical expenses, you can actually get a tax return that'll lighten your tax bill. So just keep the paperwork for any hearing aids, prosthetics, insulin pens, eyeglasses, contact lenses, vitamins, and more. You can split your CPP pension. So a CPP's pension split is, um, can make sense if you're 60 and older and the income and the tax bracket of your one spouse is higher than the other, you can split your CVP pension up to 50% with your spouse, and then you end up paying less taxes on your CVP. You can have a transfer tax credit to your spouse. So certain federal tax credits can be transferred to your spouse. Again, just um, lightening your load and balancing it out between the two of you. A uh, house offer tax credit. So for self-employed individuals, who have homeowner or who are homeowners who have home offices expenses, they can do a big tax deduction at the end of the year and claim portions of their house that they use for the home office and their business for expenses such as rent, utilities, property taxes, and, and et cetera. If you are an employee in home, so you, um, you're hiring your child or your spouse um, to lower your overall tax obligations. You can write off the salary that you're paying them as an employee. Um, just make sure that you talk to an accountant to make sure you kind of know all the specifics of that. And then of course, if you're incorporated, you also get tax breaks um, on your house and your um, entirety in there. So another place is to shop insurance. So again, another thing that doesn't require day-to-day -day sacrifice, um, it's just a one-time thing that you check and then you might be able to save some money. So be it life, home, car insurance, uh, insurance quotes for the same coverage can vary a lot depending on what company you check and um, what their qualifications are of um, what category you fall under pretty much. So shopping around for the best deal possible can save you hundreds of dollars annually. So with life insurance, compare the rates, um, find a broker or advisor or us, um, we can help you with that. Go for term insurance instead of whole life so you can invest the difference. Um, it also makes sense for a lot of people that are just buying it to make sure that they cover their debts if anything happens unexpectedly. You're not gonna have debts forever. So you don't need to have your life insurance um, or a whole life for all of your debts. You just need to have it kind of for your end of life expectancies. Look at home and vehicle insurance. Shop around um, if you're not in, in Manitoba. You can see if you can possibly, um, well, in Manitoba, you can do this. You can see if you can increase your deductible. So if you increase your deductible from being 200 to being a $500 deductible or an $1,000 deductible, then your insurance ends up being cheaper, but you have to allot for that in your emergency savings to afford that deductible. So just keep that in mind. Pay insurance premiums up front. So whenever you pay 
in bulk for let's say the year, it ends up being cheaper than if you pay monthly. So if you can afford to just pay it all at once, you end up saving some money there. So Ryan Gosling fix everything, okay? So he says, hey girl, I see you being frugal over there. He's, he likes it. So let's, let's keep on the bandwagon of being frugal, okay? <laughs> So frugal living, saving tips, um, don't try to keep up with the Joneses. So here are some overall lifestyle tips. If those big ones were too much, too big of a change, maybe we already looked at those options. We can't do anything there. Here are some other things we can do. So clothing, Canadians spend somewhere between 2.5 and 4% of their income on clothing on average. So maybe we can look into mending. Maybe we can look at going to a seamstress and seaming clothes that have a hole instead of just throwing it out and buying a new item. Maybe we get into thrift shopping. Thrift shopping's cool now. We can buy vintage, right? Trade your expensive clothes um, at consignment stores and then buy new clothes at least at a discount because you're saving um, using the money that you got back from the um, selling the clothes. Sell clothes on, on Facebook Marketplace or um, on, on Kijiji, sell your old items and use your, the money from your old items to buy new items instead of just throwing it away or just giving it away. Accessories, buy a few suitable quality accessories that last instead of buying that simple jewelry, um, or that cheap bag or the cheap clothing Buy quality so that it's going to last. And you're not going to just randomly wear it for a year or wash it once or wear it once. And then it becomes tarnished or torn or ripped. Um, make sure that you are checking the quality of the item. Fitness. Maybe there's a cheaper gym. Some gyms, um, such as in Winnipeg, Planet Fitness costs $10 a month, whereas others cost 40 to 50. So are you a gym rat? Or are you not? How often are you at the gym? Does it make sense to pay $50 a month compared to maybe paying 10 and, and popping in every now and then? Cut the cord. Some of us are spending, and this, this is, um, I think, being um, on a low scale. I was at one point spending $180 on cable by the time I added all my channels and my, my selections. So just cutting cable can be almost $200 that you're saving per month. So try using Netflix, Crave TV. You can have Netflix, Crave TV, Hulu, um, all these other ones. I, I don't know all the ones because there's so many now, but you can have 10 of them and still end up being cheaper than cable and be able to watch all your shows, maybe a day later, but you can still watch them. Cut on your water bill. Slash a few hundred dollars a year by taking small steps to improve your water. So install a low flow faucet run full loads in the dishwasher and in when you're washing your clothes use rainwater for your gardening so just put out a bucket and collect water take fewer baths shorter showers etc lower your water temperature so the higher your water the more um, energy it uses so if you lower the temperature of your water um, you end up saving plant a garden so you can grow your vegetables save money there and then you can always replace your bulbs with LEDs and then summer and winter proof your home. Habits you might wanna consider. So I know that it always just seems like, oh, it's just five bucks, it's just 20 bucks, it's just 10 bucks. But when you add it up for a lifetime or you add it up for even a month, it ends up being quite a bit and we usually don't think about it. So your smokers are gonna yell at me and hate me, but smoking is a very expensive habit. If you smoke a pack of cigarettes a day, which in, on average, the Canadian price is about $15 a package, it will cost you $334,000 um, plus over a 60 year lifetime. And if you're like, well, I don't smoke cigarettes, maybe you're a weed smoker, but it's no better. Over a course of 60 years, if you have a nightly joint, it could cost you $219,000. That is a hefty price. That's almost maybe half or a third of your possible retirement. Playing the lottery. I know we're always like, well, if I win the million, then I'm, I'm at my retirement goal. Boom, just like that, right? But what if you don't win the, the million dollar ticket? Assuming you... Um, the average return on a dollar ticket is 47 cents. Buying a dollar ticket every day for 60 years 
is almost $11,600. Paying your credit cards bills late and getting those late fees all the time. That's about $25 a month that you can be charged on late fees over a 60 year period, that's 18,000. Withdrawing cash from ATMs instead of going to a bank. You pay $3 on a network ATM fee twice a week for 60 years, that's $19,000. Letting food go to waste. A family of four spends about $175 per week on groceries and about $40 per week is left to food waste. So over 60 years, that $40 a week adds up to $125,000. Drinking bottled water. I know a lot of us don't want to get a filter. Um, we don't want to drink it at the tap. So we buy bottled water. And this is just the regular water. This isn't the Fiji or the special water, okay? Okay. But drinking two bottles of water, and you should consume a lot of water per day. So drinking two bottles of water at $3 each per day will cost you $131,000 in 60 years. That's a lot of, it's expensive water. <laughs> Especially if you think of that $131,000 now possibly being invested at 7% over 60 years, right? Drinking too much booze, drinking three drinks a day, might not seem excessive or extreme, but if you drink, if your drink costs four dollars, which is cheap to what most drinks cost at um, a restaurant, you could be spending two hundred and sixty-three thousand over the course of sixty years. So if you're sitting here and being like, "Wow, I do all of those things," if you just changed your habits here, that's pretty much your retirement. So just ask yourself how much those habits are worth. Is it worthwhile to continue those habits or is it worthwhile to change? In summary, I know that we went through quite a, a bit of ways to save. Um, and if you've made it this far, I hope you've learned some new tricks to save something that resonates with you. You don't have to do all of them. You just have to pick one. Um, but start by getting that saver's mindset. The sky's the limit. Saving money is one of the best habits you could ever form. And it starts off small. It starts with that $1 and it expands. So I hope you can do that for yourself and then impact your life on a grand scale. So I want you to review your goals. Review your financial goals on a regular basis, your family goals, your personal goals, your work situation. They may change and that can affect your budget. You can fluctuate it as you go, but make sure you're constantly reviewing it and make sure it's what you want. Sometimes we have an idea in our head of what we want. We look back two weeks later and we're like, that's, you know, that's actually not as important to me as I might've thought. So it can, it can change and fluctuate as you go. Minor changes make big impact. So it might just be that you start by storing your, your spare change and that's all you change. That's fine. Maybe it's just that you're changing your, your coffee. Instead of doing Starbucks, you're doing Tim's and you're saving $2. That's a change. Maybe it's, okay, I'm going to walk to work one day a week. That's a change. So anything in that direction towards a better financial stability, a better financial future, a a closer alignment to your budget is a win. Make it a habit. Drop any loose change in a container every time you go home. Create a savings reminder on your smartphone to put $5 in an account or to um, restructure something. Put sticky, sticky notes in your wallet or on your mirror or on your fridge. Maybe tape a, a paper on your credit card that says, do I want this? So you have to tap, <laughs> look at this before you tap your card. <laughs> Automate your savings. So choose a saving account, date and frequency, and then set it up so that it just automatically transfers all the time. You don't have to think about it. Out of sight, out of mind, but it's getting done. Don't keep up with the Joneses. I think that social media and society has put this on us where we need to be the best. If, if Cece has an iPhone, the newest iPhone, I need to get the newest iPhone. If someone so got a new car, I need to get a new car. If, if they renovated their house, I need to renovate. Forget about them. You're on your own path. You're on your own journey. You don't know what their financial situation is like. They could be way worse than you, but just barely staying afloat. You don't know. 
So don't spend lavishly to impress people who really don't care. They're so obsessed with themselves and trying to do the same. They don't, they're not going to worry about you. They're just going to try to, you know, better themselves again, right? When you feel the pressure to replace your car every two years, do a home renovation that's not necessarily necessary. Have the greenest grass in the block. Use the latest smartphone because you want to keep up with your neighbor or your friends or keep up with the Joneses. Just do yourself a favor and close your wallet and realize that you're doing this for a purpose. You're doing this for a reason. You're doing this to better yourself and your future self will thank you. And I guarantee you that they're going to be looking at you and MB down the road when their smartphone is now the old smartphone and they're updating it again. And you now have an emergency savings and investments. And you're, you just have this glow and peace around you because you know that you're okay financially. It's more mm. than what money can buy. That feeling and that, that energy you're going to be exuding. Final thoughts. An emergency fund is a must-have tool. It's your personal financial toolkit. It can prevent you from digging into a long-term savings, from closing your investments, or to get into unexpected debt just because of an unexpected event. Stuff happens. You lose your job. You face significant loss of income. So ideally, you want to have that three to six month savings that's easy accessible and that um, you can set aside an amount that is easy, comfortable, and you can do on a consistent basis. So I hope that you understand that an emergency fund is essential that it's worthwhile, um, kind of the structure of how to do it and some places and resources of how to try to find some funds to allocate towards emergency savings. So one thing I will say is if you're looking through all these and you do pick ideas to save, make sure you know of what you're saving. So if you save $2 on coffee, make sure you put that $2 in your savings or else it's just gonna be re reallocated somewhere else. So as you chip away and you save, Figure out how much you saved with that deduction and then put that money in a savings account because you're used to spending that money anyways, okay? If you need help figuring out how to create your emergency savings or need help just kind of figuring out where you can um, reallocate the funds or if you want help setting up an account and you want to just make sure it's done properly and growing at a, at a good speed, message Angie, message myself, and we can help you look at your situation, customize that plan, we can work with you to be accountability partners and we can get you to that amount that you need. Mm -hmm. So I don't want you to feel overwhelmed here. I want this to be a fun experience. I want you to have that peace of mind that this emergency fund is going to provide you of just feeling like, wow, if I want, if I have a situation at my job where I'm just, I can't handle anymore. I can't be, maybe I, maybe it's an unhealthy work environment, but you feel stuck there because you're paycheck to paycheck to paycheck. This emergency fund will help you have the ability to take that time off and switch jobs and look around. Maybe it's a situation where your mom calls and she's in a different province or a different state or a different country and she's sick. This emergency fund will allow you to drop everything and fly to where she is and not think about money. This emergency fund will have you hit a bump in the road and just be like, well, thank God for an emergency savings and that's all it's gonna be. So think of those things and, and remind yourself every day that this is why I'm being frugal. This is why I'm cutting coupons. This is why I don't have cable. This is why blank. And, and just really know that you're, you're doing it for your own benefit. You're paying yourself first. Mm -hmm. so that's it for this week. Next week, we are going to be looking at evaluating your career options. So maybe you were looking at this and you're like, cool. So I did all that. And I'm still living paycheck to paycheck. <laughs> now what? So your two options are either to earn more or spend less. So if we have drained everything down to needs and we still don't have enough, then the only option left is to earn more. And you might be thinking, Shay, I have kids. I don't have any qualifications. How am I supposed to earn more? Well, I'm going to give you some easy entry jobs that you can get into that are work from home or that are easy entry so that you can maybe look at other options as far as 
earning extra income. And then that way you don't change your lifestyle. You just earn more and that gets allocated towards investments and savings. So stay tuned for next week when we elaborate into that. Yay. <clears throat> Thank you so much everybody for watching. And uh, yeah, we really hope that there was at least a few little tidbits in, in here. You know what? I, I got to say that I, I learned a little bit as well. So, you know, when put it in the win column. So thank you so much. And as you're watching, make sure that you hit the subscribe button. Make sure that you hit like, uh, comment, because that helps us out as well as we go forward. Um, and also make sure to check down in the uh, description area because there's some valuable information there in case you want um, a personal look or if you need some questions uh, answered, information clarified, um, we're here for you. So thank you so much. Um, oh, I see that there's, was there some um, resources there? There were. Um, I always like to give credit where credit's due. Um, I know sometimes I do forget, but these are the websites that I went to. So if you do want to check out the official um, site that I got it from, then um, that's that's them there. But like Angie said, like, comment, subscribe. If there's anything you guys want us to talk about that we haven't yet, we're always open to doing more videos past the 90 day commitment. So leave comments as to what you want us to talk about next, or if you want us to expand on anything and we'd be more than happy to do a video on it or just answer your questions in the comments. Fabulous. Well, thank you so much, everybody. And make sure you have a great night and we'll see you next week. Bye.